Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a show business legend who's conquered the stage, screen, and recording studio in a spectacular career spanning over five decades. He first became a sensation in London's West End for his portrayal of Roth in The Sound of Music, a role he performed 1,500 times during the show's three-year run. He made his feature film debut in Oh, What a Lovely War, directed by Sir Richard Attenborough. And he's appeared in numerous films and TV shows since then, including the hilarious The Gods Must Be Crazy 2. In 1969, he relocated to South Africa and has become a beloved superstar of stage and screen. He starred in numerous productions and is most remembered for his sensational performance as the narrator in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. In fact, his album from that show achieved gold status with a million sales. He's also a highly gifted producer of blockbuster shows, including Hairspray and Saturday Night Fever. But he's probably best known as the producer, creator, and director of the multi-award winning musical production entitled African Footprint which showcases the diverse talents of South Africans to sold out audiences across the world. This consummate entertainer received Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Arts and Culture Trust and the Naledi Awards. What a thrill to welcome Richard Loring to our show. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Harvey, uh, after that introduction, I feel like I should say thank you and goodbye. <laughs> but but what, what a wonderful introduction and thank you and I have to say, when you read it out like that, and and you, I sometimes lay awake at night and think, I'm writing my book at the moment, as you know, and I go back on the stories and I think, no, that, that can't have happened to me and that couldn't have happened to me. But the interesting thing is that everything that I've actually done, there's been a link to the next passage of my life. As, as we sit here now, here's a new chapter opening, uh, being interviewed very graciously by you, and I feel honored to be interviewed by you. And I'm happy to talk to you and talk about a few of the events that have happened in my career. Well, I must tell you, Richard, that when I was writing your introduction, I found it hard to keep it reasonably brief because you've achieved so much in so many mediums that it's hard to do you justice in a brief introduction. So please forgive me if I omitted anything important. I think you I think you did everything. And I had a very dear friend who was a, a big showman. He did all the big Sun City extravaganzas. And he always used to say to me when we did show presentations, Richard, put it on the back of a cigarette packet. And if you can't sell it from that, he said, why didn't you go and sell hardware or sell motor cars? Because he said, that's where you do. And, and it's the same with this, to try and... Talk about a career of 56 years is impossible. But however, there are certain highlights that I'm sure we'll touch on that really make what for me has been an incredible journey and a journey that's still continuing so exciting and, and, and uh, just wanting it to go on. You grew up on the Isle of Guernsey and you were already singing in the church choir when you were seven. Did you always want to be a performer? I I remember just just briefly going back on Guernsey is uh, the Guernsey were the the Channel Islands were the only islands occupied by the the Nazis during the Second World War, and so I obviously I don't remember it. But at the age of one, in with my mother in my mother's arms and three other children, my two brothers and a sister, we were put on a boat whilst the machine guns were machine gun in the harbour and taken to England, where we put into a home for five years, a home which the British government provided to us. I met my brothers and sisters two years later. And eventually, seven years later, the ship turns up at the docks in St. Peterport and my mother points out and says, that's your father down there. Fortunately, I'm not quite sure whether it was because they actually wanted to get rid of us on a Sunday, but they took us to the local church, thank goodness. And my two brothers and my sister were all taken into the St. John's Anglican Church Choir. So at the age of seven, I was ensconced in the choir along with them. Of course, that was the start of a career which, uh, along with my mother and father's help, and I'm sure a lot of people listening will identify with this. I didn't come from a privileged background. I came from a background of people who'd gone through two world wars, economic depression. So when I say they paid a shilling a week for my singing lessons, two singing lessons a week, that was a lot of money to them. But the interesting thing is that shilling a week has taken me on a journey 
around the world where I have met the stars of screen and stage and radio and books and meeting people like you. So what an investment in my future. At the age of 15 and a half, there was a man called Carol Levis. He had a talent competition in England called Opportunity Knox. And my brother and I were invited to go on the show. He was 13 and a half. I was 15. And we won the competition. And so all of a sudden, our whole world exploded. And I make a joke about it. But every Methodist church, Roman Catholic church, every hospital, every pri- even the prisons said, will you come along and sing to us? But the bottom line is, that gave me the start of a career, which then took me into repertory theater. And then, of course, the inevitable, unfortunately, or regrettably, when my father passed away in 1962, Thank goodness my mother was uh, strong enough, emotionally strong enough to say, you son, you've got to go off and do what you want to do. And I went off to Manchester to join the Ken Dodd show where I was for six months, arrived in Manchester in 62. Uh, and it's interesting with everybody wearing masks now, because when I got off the train in Manchester in 1962, everybody was wearing masks. But that was for a different reason. It was because of the smog that was around and the pollution around in those days. So that was the start of my journey. 1962, Ken Dodd show in Manchester. And the next minute, I'm in the West End of London. Well, let's go to that. You were an understudy in the London West End production of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Now, as you know, we recently lost Stephen Sondheim and you were his dear friend for many years. Can you hear some uh, memories of Stephen with us? Oh, oh, absolutely. It's it's the greatest pleasure for me because he was such such a wonderful man. And as I've found with all people who are uh, exceptionally talented, famous, perhaps wealthy beyond beyond belief for all the the right reasons, which doesn't come into the equation, but humble to the extreme. And he took an immediate liking to me. And we, I used to sometimes go to the Savoy Hotel and have a breakfast with him or lunch before we'd start our rehearsals. And a, a little thing that I always remember he used to say to me, he said, Richard, he's, we were talking about Sondheim, we were talking about um, West Side Story, which, of course, as you know, I played and I played Tony and, and Snowboy. But we always used to talk about West Side Story. He said, Richard, he said, I have to say, if anybody comes along and sings a song from West Side Story, he said, they're either mad or they're a genius. <laughs> so what he was really saying was his songs were tricky, to say the least. Uh, he, was, he was a great exponent of, 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 the, of the written word. He was a very deep thinker, uh, a very gentle giant. And I call him a giant because he was quite a big man, as you know, and regrettably, well, two occasions, in fact, <laughs> when I was in New York in 1993 with my assistant and we were staying in West 56th Street. And I said to Cameron McIntosh, who, of course, we'll mention in a moment, he's a great, great friend, a colleague I grew up with. And he said, to me, Richard, we're putting it together at the Manhattan and you're invited. So I say, fantastic. And late afternoon, I'm in the flat and the phone rings. Now, normally my associate, Debbie, would always pick up the phone, but I picked up the phone and the voice went, hi, Richard. I'm so looking forward to seeing you. I haven't seen you for years. This is Stephen Sondheim. And I went, oh, and she heard the call from the bathroom and she screamed. She said, why did you pick up the phone? Anyway, the bottom line is we went to see the show. He said, I'm really looking forward to seeing you. And I made a mistake. I thought the show started at eight o'clock and we got there 20 past seven to walk into an empty theater foyer. And we walked down the stairs talking loudly to each other. And the voice from the bottom said, Richard, why don't you keep quiet? The show has started. And there's Sir Cameron McIntosh standing at the bottom of the stage. He said, what happened? I said, I, sorry, I thought the show started at eight. He said, Steve sends his love and his best wishes. He said, he's sorry. He has to go back to Connecticut. And I thought that would be the last occasion. And then two years ago, Cameron invited me to the opening night of Company at the uh, John Gilgood Theatre. And he was going to be there. And Cameron said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I've just dedicated the Queen's Theatre to Sondheim. I've done it all up. Why don't the two of you come around with me? We'll do a trip around the theatre. Then we'll see the show at night. Then we'll have supper together. Regretfully, that was the last time Stephen Sondheim appeared in England because he did somebody damaged his leg, which he, of course, he suffered with for the last two years. And regrettably, as you know, he passed away a few weeks ago, which is, which is sad, sad, sad. But I have to say, he, like so many musicians and so many writers and so many performers, is going to leave a history behind him, which is 
it's going to be very, very hard to fill. I don't know who the next genius, and I say genius in the right word, will come along and find that kind of knowledge that he had, that intellectual knowledge and that grasp of theatre and music and being able to put it together in the lyrics that we, would, we go out crying from the songs. And that night, in, incidentally, at the Manhattan Theatre, as we got down there, Cameron said to me, let's stand at the back. And he pulled the curtain at the side, and we stood at the back, and as he pulled the curtains to the side, guess who came out and stood on the stage and sang Send in the Clowns, but Julie Andrews. After 30 years of absence from the stage, there she was, standing in front of us singing, isn't it rich, aren't we a pair? Yeah. Wonderful. That is a memory indeed. Wow. Now, you became immensely popular for your iconic performance as Rolf in The Sound of Music. You played yes. that role for three years. Did you ever get tired of singing You Are 16 Going on 17? Well, no, because it made me think I was 16 going on 17. And now, now I have to sing about 60 going on 70. But in those days, no, you know, the, the whole thing with theatre, artists who say to me, we're bored and we've got to go and do the show again. I said, well, you're in the wrong business, because what we always have to remember as a performer is that although we may feel a bit jaded, maybe we haven't had a good day, we're not feeling well like the other day. Our audience doesn't know that. It's a brand new audience. And unless you have an audience out there who have actually seen you before, nobody's seen you, nobody's seen the show. They've come to experience something. So the challenge is actually challenging yourself to actually take a step back and say, this is who I am. This is what the performance is about. Needless to say, I did have a couple of bumps along the way. I got onto the bike one day to go onto the stage and Liesl would be there and I'd say Liesl and she would say Rolf and I would say Liesl. And as I got on the stage, a, a, a kind of a, a panic attack took over. Maybe I was a bit tired. I lost all my words. I couldn't think of my words. And all Liesl could keep saying was Rolf, 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 until eventually the, my, the uh, musical director picked the cue up and did da 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 and I went, you wait, little girl, on it, and we were into the song. And so, you know, something that clicks in, and yeah, 1,500 performances, it seems like yesterday. Um, and one little story, if, if you're interested, was, because we have many, you have many memorable nights when you're in a show like that. You become a family in the true sense of the word. I mean, the lovely story when all the nuns who were on the third floor would get into the lift and they were told night after night, please don't all get into the lift together because it is going to get stuck. Well, one night, just before Constance Choplack, who was the, the mother of the abbess, uh, was going on stage to sing Climb Every Mountain, they were all in the lift and the lift went whoop and got stuck. And they were stuck in the lift. So she stood on the stage where she would normally have a chorus of 30 nuns around her. She stood there. And as they all drifted on the stage, looking like little penguins, very sorry for themselves, she sang, climb every... But with a look on her face, knew, knowing that afterwards, nobody was ever going to go down in that lift again. <laughs> what did you think of the movie version of The Sound of Music compared to the Broadway show? I, I think it's wonderful. I, I think there's always a, obviously an incredible danger when you fall in love with a show and you fall in love with the characters and you somehow, I think it's that moment of, of the truth of theatre, why we love theatre, is that at that moment in time when I jumped on my bike and it fell into the orchestra pit, that moment when I forgot my words and other people do that in a show, those are, the, those are the moments in the show that are real and makes the whole show come alive. Somehow on film, it's all uncellular. It's captured for posterity, for good, for bad, indifferent, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I think they captured the sound of music beautifully. I think Christopher Plummer was a, a wonderful performer, very sympathetic. I think Julie Andrews was wonderful. And if we have to look at all of the accolades that come in, all right, we can say, well, yes, that's your uh, ordinary members of the public. What did the crits think? Well, the crits, when Sound of Music opened in London in the early 60s, it had the words crit, crits of any musical. Did it deter people coming to see the show? Absolutely not, because eventually the people themselves make up their mind. We can have a crit who can say, I hate the show, don't go and see it. If the show is good and can survive that criticism of whoever it is, they will survive. But they will survive 
because the show has merit. And The Sound of Music, I think, had merit both in terms of the show and we don't have to talk about the film because I think probably like the Judy Garland show that appears every every year, it probably comes up and I'm sure the children sit around the television and they can't wait for Julie Andrews to come running down the hills of Austria singing, the hills are alive, et cetera, et cetera. Richard, tell us about your decision to relocate to South Africa. Given the history of that country, I think a lot of people might not understand why someone would move there and then stay there through so much instability. Yes, you know, I had I had gone through, I came out of the show called A Student Prince at the Cambridge Theatre. That was my fourth West End show. I was playing Detlef. Widely applauded and widely acknowledged by the Delfont agency, a big agency in um, in London, Delfont, and they wanted me to go to Blackpool and take second lead against uh, the lead John Hansen. And as it so happens, maybe rightly or wrongly, I maybe I put too big a price on my head, or maybe they just thought we can get a lawing at half the price, and if if we can make some money from it. So the bottom line was, from being the fifth lead in the show with my name up on the billboards in the West End of London, I just bought a murder, I just bought a house, I just got married, and all of a sudden, I was out of work. I was on the door and there was nothing going on. And I finished up, and I say this uh, with, uh, with modesty, I, I would finish up driving a bread van at four o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock and then washing motor cars and selling motor cars and doing all that kind of thing to keep ends together as all actors do. But I must say it was a, it was a humbling experience and a good experience because when you nightly have 1,100, 2,000, 3,000 people applauding you, you know what, you can float out of that dressing room, that, that stage door every night, uh, thinking you're, you're pretty cool, you're, you're great. And then when all of a sudden the reality hits you that, yeah, you still have to earn a living, you still have to keep a family going, and you still have to make a living, it, it comes to about. So the bottom line was I did that for about four or five months, a little bit of a waking up call, and out of the blue... I got a phone call and said, Noel, Noel Toby here, Richard, how are you? I said, I'm fine. He said, Richard, remember we met when we did a funny thing happened on the way to the forum in Bromley. We did a, a second version of that, a touring version. I said, absolutely. He said, I'm going to South Africa. I'm doing a show called The Boyfriend. You can play Tony or Bobby. Um, I don't mind. It's your choice. And he said, I believe you've just lost out on Dames at Sea, which I had. I'd auditioned for six months for Dames at Sea, right at the last minute. The other performer looked, uh, he was dark, he, dark hair. He looked more American than I did. So they chose him. So he said, what do you think? I said, OK, I'll, I'll play the part of Tony. So I came out to South Africa, slightly mixed reservations. I must, I must be honest. But the wonderful thing because we were touring the show, although we opened in Johannesburg, because we were touring the show, I got the chance to go through an Africa that just was going through terrible, terrible times, but not as bad then in, the, in, the, in those days. Yes, it was black and white. It was the apartheid system. But you were not really aware of it on a day-to-day -day basis. And I fell in love with the country. And then when, out of the blue, the same management said, we're doing a production of uh, West Side Story, would you like to stay on and play St uh, Snowboy um, and, and understudy the American lead, uh, Michael Harrington Harris? Uh, I said, absolutely. And as a result of that, again, uh, doing the show, traveling the country, I really fell in love with the people. And now when I say the people, I'm talking about everybody, the black, the white, the Suta, the Zulu, the, the, the Swana, the Vendor, the, the Afrikaner of, of all levels of life. And so I then made the decision uh, I didn't make a, a decision and say, I'm going to stay here. I was happy with what I was doing. I was then very, very fit. I used to play a lot of squash and used to play a lot of soccer and football. And I started putting soccer games together with my own team and going into Soweto in the 70s. Just before the Soweto riots, I had my soccer team in there. Just after the Soweto riots in 1978, I put on the first black and white soccer tournament at Orlando Stadium. So is that a, a means of saying, no, you were in a country that really was not looking after people? No, not at all. But I felt in a small way, I was doing my bit. I was taking people under my wing wherever I could, which led me, of course, eventually to African Footprint. But I was actually mentoring people already then. And I felt, could I do this back in, in England? Probably, possibly, 
but not quite in the same way. And then, of course, my career took off with movies, uh, The Winners Won, or My Way Overseas, Played Overseas, Cecil Data, Diamond Mercenaries with uh, Telly Savalas, uh, but The Gods Must Be Crazy. I did about 10 movies. And then I had a recording career. So there were a whole lot of things that were keeping me there. It was not about money. I was, I was loving the lifestyle and the people. And in a way, whatever I did then, has led to who I am today and what I eventually finish up doing. Now, was that planned? No, it wasn't. But somehow, if you put things into life, they come back at you, I think, in a way. Now, given your success on the stage in London, did you ever consider moving to New York and pursuing a career on Broadway or going to Hollywood? I had uh, interesting, that on, on those, both on, on those two aspects, I had my very good friend, I've mentioned his name, Cameron McIndrosh, many times uh, because we shared a flat. And he then said to me, even in those days, said, Richard, uh, I'm going to be in one of these days the world's leading show producer. And I'll just tell a little bit, bit of a funny story about him because when we were sharing the flat, he had just put his first show together, Little Women, and um, he was touring it. And he came back one night. He said, Richard, I want to, I've got an eight millimeter camera, I think it was called in those days. And he said, I filmed the show. And he said, I want to put it down on video. What, have you got a record there? Uh, you know, I said, what, what record? I mean, it was 1967. I think I just got a record player. But in fact, I had a copy of a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. So we started editing this little, as you know what it's like with editing. And so the, the, the opening line of something familiar, something goes on and on and on and on. It goes on forever until there's a knock on the door at three o'clock in the morning. And the lady from the, below has come up from below. She banged on the door with a stick. He said, if you two thespians or whatever you call yourself, don't stop this horrible something familiar, something peculiar, I am going to call the police. Do you understand? Now, that was Cameron McIntosh. Today, the world's leading show producer, who then said to me, in those days, I am going to be the leading show. But why aren't you coming back? He's a very good friend, Barry Burnett, a top, top manager, said, Richard, come on back, come on back. And yes, there were interests when I did The Winners. And then I followed that up with the Cecil Data. Um, an agent came over from New York and said, we'd really be interested in looking at you and would you come on over? And, and you know what, Harvey? It's one of those things. Do I have any regrets? No, I don't. Would I have liked to have gone? Do I think I could have done something? Yes, given the right, given the right things that happened to you, I think I could have done. But then would I have stayed... Um, in South Africa, number one, most importantly, would I have stayed in South Africa by 1971? Regrettably, I'd, I'd already got divorced. I had a, a, a little bit of a bad breakup there, which in a way kept me on, on in, in uh, South Africa. And then I met the most beautiful, beautiful lady who is my wife today. I've been, been married for 35 years. I've got two wonderful children. So when people say to me, yes, but what if? There's no what if. Because if I had done that, I would not have met my wife, Jeanette. And I would not have had the two Oscars in my life, which are my daughter, Samantha, and my daughter, Natasha, because I look upon those as my Oscars. Oh, absolutely. Now, of all your stage roles in South Africa, you're best remembered for strutting onto the stage in high heels and weird socks <laughs> as the narrator in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. The show's yeah. lyricist, Tim Rice, stated yeah. publicly that you were the best he had ever seen in that role. You must be so proud of that, Richard. Well, I am. And the interesting thing, again, it, it's just amazing how all of these things kind of link in together, because in 1967 in London, um, I just signed a recording contract with the great EMI, Abbey Road. I'd signed that contract with Sir Joseph Lockwood at, at the White Horse in in Marble Arch, we'd had sup, lunch, took me for lunch, and we signed the contract. That was the mighty Sir Joseph Lockwood, mighty EMI. I had a seven-year recording contract recorded at Abbey Road, and I can always remember Bob Barrett, my recording manager, a and man, saying to me one day, Richard, I want you to meet Nori Paramore, who was very high up in, in EMI, uh, recorded Cliff and all of the guys, all the young ones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he said, he's a and man, uh, Tim Rice. So I met Tim then, who played a couple of his songs to me. And Bob Barrett said to me after, what do you think, Richard? I said, well, yeah, I think they're great, but they're a little bit kind of showy. 
<laughs> and I, a little bit as in, you know, eventually Joseph and the Amazing Ted are color green coat and Evita and in JC Superstar. So, I mean, boy, was that was that a mistake? But that's when I first met him. And interestingly enough, when he came out to South Africa, he came out to South Africa after we had had this enormous success with, with Joseph, bigger than anything else in the world. It had not had that success that it had in South Africa. He came out because I had been asked to play uh, opposite Tenny Savalas, uh, Mr. Kojak, in, in uh, Diamond Mercies or Killer Force, which starred Peter Fonda and O.J. Simpson and Maud Adams, etc., etc. And I played opposite him and... Uh, I had signed the contract because when we opened Joseph, we thought it was only going to be a four week season. Well, I don't have to tell you on that third, that opening night, having had disastrous technical rehearsals and everything else on that opening night, the audience stood with the critics. In, it seemed like for 15 minutes and applaud until eventually we all stood there and all the cast went step step do something do something do something so very quietly i kind of stepped forward in my high heels and my top hat and i said would you like some more yes that became the cry the call for the next 15 years that i was involved that night after night we would do those those calls and the audience would just stand and applaud and applaud and applaud and i think if i have to kind of comment on how it changed my career, which of course it did. You become an instant recognized figure. Even though I'd been in the West End, I'd done four shows, I had records, I'd been in movies, uh, I'd already done something in South Africa. It took that performance to, uh, and uh, in fairness, that performance and the performance in the winners to catapult me into what you call hot, however you define hot, hot status. And, and all of a sudden, what was going to be a four-week season, which led to my uh, leaving to sign the contract for uh, Diamond Mercenaries or Killer Force, uh, led to Tim coming out. And when Tim came to see the show on that opening night, before he took over as Pharaoh, and then the man who was playing Pharaoh, Alvin Collison, who was my friend for 45 years, unfortunately passed away only a month ago, a great, great friend. And Tim walked along the line and said, hello, 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 hello. He said, Loring, Loring. And he looked at me, old school boy fashion, and said, were we at school together? Now, as he went to public school, I said, no, but I met you at EMI with Bob Brad. He said, oh, yes, of course, he said. Well done, well done. And that was the start of a friendship, which went on until eventually I put on one of my big hits at my soundstage theater, which was called A Touch of Weber and A Taste of Rice where I put the two people together as opposing each other in both of, in their lyrics and their songs and put, and he eventually heard about it and flew out to see it. I knew nothing about it and turned up at the theater saying, I've come to see this show you've written about me. I said, Oh, well, 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 well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. In 1977, you recorded two songs with your longtime friend, Sir Cliff Richard at Abbey road studios in London. Yes. The two songs were There'll Never Be Anyone Else But You and Wonderful Summer. That must yeah. have been an amazing experience. Yes, it was. I mean, Cliff came in. I was at that, that stage. I was in between uh, stage shows when there would be a break in the stage shows. I would do a season of cabaret uh, around the country. And he was at, uh, on a holiday. I didn't know that. He was at holiday at the Beverly Hills where I was performing. And that night... Uh, or that afternoon, all of a sudden I see in the distance Cliff, who I'd met, incidentally, just very, very briefly in London. So we kind of had an Im imagery of each other. Of course, he was the big star. I was just, you know, Richard Loring at the, at the poolside. Anyway, we introduced us. He said, hey, Richard, I'm, I'm coming to see your show tonight. I said, oh, bo -bo 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 oh, okay, with his manager. Anyway, it was a great show. We talked afterwards. We played squash together. We played tennis. And I'll never forget, he, as he left, he said, Richard, he said, you know what? You, you mentioned about people saying, come back to London. He said, why don't you, you know, you should come back to London and record at Abbey Road. I said, oh, that, that sounds like a great idea. Why don't we do that, you see? And, and he went away kind of smiling. And I went away laughing and smiling. Thinking, oh, yeah, well, it never happened. And I'm, I'm kind of continuing my cabaret season. And I'm down at the Elizabeth Hotel. And it's early hours of the morning. And I get a telegram, seven o'clock in the morning, there's a telegram. Hi, Richard, I've put the dates together. 
EMI, Abbey Road Studios, August the 16th, 17th, 18th, that week, very important week, 1997, uh, coming over, we'll record few, four numbers together. And I'll never forget because in the room next to me, there was a man called Eddie Calvert. And if anybody who's listening looks up the name Eddie Calvert, he was the man with the golden trumpet. Cherry Prink and Apple Possum Time, Own oh My Papa, et cetera, et cetera. And all I remember is thinking, I've got to talk to somebody. I've got to... So I knocked on the door and he came to the door in his dressing gown. He's had a few drinks, the night, obviously, the night before, looking very bleary eyed. He said, what can I do for you, son? I said, well, I've got this telegram from Cliff Richard saying I'm going to record at Abbey Road Shoes. He said, oh, oh, OK. He walks over to the phone, picks up the phone. He says, Will you send up a bucket with a nice bottle of French champagne and two glasses? Thank you. Puts the, and he said, you've got to grab the moment, son. Enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting enough, you mentioned that. I said to him, Cliff, how did this call come about? He said, well, when I left you, he said, I kind of innocently said, why didn't you come back and record with me? And then you said, OK, when? And then got the dates. And of course, I got the dates, arrived in London, Got up early that morning to get the voice going and feel excited and everything. And the phone rings and it's Cliff Richard's office saying the recordings have been cancelled, postponed until tomorrow. Cliff has just heard that Elvis Presley has died. And the recording was off. And so we had to go the next day because obviously he was always considered the, uh, the British Presley, the British rock and roller. And so the whole of the world wanted to get a comment from him. Well, I'm glad you finally did it. Now, in the late 80s, you reinvented yourself as a very successful producer, first with dinner theater shows and then big productions that toured nationally and internationally. You opened two new theaters at Gold Reef City. Where did yes. you acquire the business expertise to become this big empresario? Well, I was very lucky. When I, when I was young, I, I uh, listened to everything that was given to me and, and, and observed. And before I left Guernsey, I was already working for a subsidiary of Ford Motor Company. I'd worked with them before as a young guy on administration. And they moved me up. And I was a, a, a deputy sales manager, for want of a better word, at the age of 19. They sent me off to Dagenham in London, where the Ford Motor Company were based. And I learned a few skills there. So I learned a little bit about business. But I think, I think it's all about instinct, if, if you want my honest opinion. Obviously, you have to follow certain rules. You're not going to be all things to all people. You're not going to be creative and, and, and have financial acumen. If you do have, you're very, very lucky. But if you have one of those skills and you're able to employ a good team of people around you, which I was able to do, but to give you an example how it started was in 19... 88, I was at the Piccadilly Theatre in London, and I was watching Joe Brown and the Brothers, and they're doing a show called Pump Boys and Dinettes, and I'm really enjoying it. And I'm thinking to myself, I've never seen uh, popcorn in the, in the foyer, and I've never seen beer in the foyer. And anyway, in the interval, I'm sitting down, this man walks in where, along the aisle with two boxes of popcorn and two beer ca canisters full of beer, and he trips over a woman's handbag, and it all falls into the woman's lap. And as she went ah, like that, I went, ah, hang on, how about if you put the popcorn and the beer or the Coke on a table and you sat in the theater and watched the same show I'm watching in that environment as opposed to a perceived straight theater. And so that popped in my head. I went back. I talked to my very, very good a theatre person who used to get all of the shows, who used to book all of the shows that were never available. And I said to him very quietly, I said, Peter, do, what do you think of Pump Boys and Ernest? He said, oh, no, rubbish. We'd never put it on. I thought, yay, that's great. I've got a show. So I have got a West End show, Pump Boys. I find this venue, which is an old soundstage, a movie studio. I pack it full of tables. I was going to open with Pump Boys and Ernest, but fortunately, my associate said, why don't you do will meet again that show you've been it's been sitting in your head from your time as a youngster your dad who fought in the first world war your history of 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 the of the war and your uh, uh, your knowledge of it why don't you do a show so i put a tribute to the other called for vera lynn called will meet again well 300 people arrived on the opening night bangers and mash Mushy Peas, the program was a newspaper from the Second World War with all the songs in it. And all I can remember, night after night, for five years, 300 shows a night, eight shows a week, people singing, we'll meet again. 
don't know where, don't know where. And that, that launched my career as a producer. Everybody said, how can you go to Halfway House? Who's going to come to Halfway House? Well, you know what? Everybody. Because there were people out there who'd fought in the war. They came with their medals. They came with their regimental ties. They brought their mothers, their sisters, their families. And when we finished five years later, if you said to me now, Richard, out of your whole career, just take one moment. I'm standing in the foyer three weeks into the show, and everybody's going past and saying, well done, Richard, well done. We love the mushy peas. We love the bangers and match. We thought the show were going to come back again. Da, da, da. And this very elegant lady comes up to me, gray-haired, very elegant, very tall, and she said, Mr. Loring. I said, no, it's not Mr. Loring. It's Richard. She said, Richard, I just want to tell you I've had the most incredible experience, she said. You've taken me back to my childhood, uh, a young woman. And she said, I'm down on the docks. And we're down on the docks. We're singing the song you were singing tonight, Wish Me Luck. And he stood on the gangplank and he took his helmet off and he waved to me. She said, now, there's no way you could see me. There were hundreds of us there and we're all singing. The sirens are going. I said, oh, that's marvelous. By then she'd taken hold of my hands and I went to take my hands away. And she said, no, don't do that, Richard. She said, he looked at me and I never saw him again. And I went, oh, and I went to pull my hands away. By then she was crying and I was. I said, no, don't, don't do that, Rich. She said, you have brought back feelings and memories tonight that I will never experience again. And I just want to thank you from my heart and good night. And that was it. So when we talk about theater and we talk about cinema, it's those kind of experiences. That I think that when one gets the opportunity to express it either in a performance or through your production, or in some way, bring people into your your being, like Sondheim, like like the greats do. I, I just think that's a gift. That, well, for me, it's it's a god. It's a, it's a god's gift. I've, I've been blessed. I've been blessed. You've been blessed, and you've just shown us one example of how you've blessed so many people. Mm-hmm. Now, as I said in my introduction, mm-hmm. you are probably best known internationally for African Footprint which is a magnificent and highly acclaimed musical show that you created, produced, and directed. What inspired you to create this masterpiece that's enchanted the whole world? Yes, it was 1996-97. Cameron, or Sir Cameron McIntosh, invited me and my friend Peter Treen. He was opening Miss Saigon at the Capitol Theatre in in Sydney. He said, come on out. Let's go around the yacht in Sydney Harbour. Let's drink champagne together. That's what buddies do, you know, when you when eventually you've moved on from living in a one in a bed sitter, you you ha- you get the yacht, you get the champagne, come to the opening night, which is absolutely wonderful. And the next night the three of us are sitting in the Footbridge Theatre and I'm seeing a show called Tap Dogs. And 300 people jumped to their feet and I thought, that that's interesting. Did you enjoy it? Yes I did, but yeah, not that much. Not to that extent. A year later the show was in London. 18 months later, I was in New York. I saw the show again, and I thought, wow, there's, there's something there that I've missed. And coming back on the plane from New York to South Africa, which in those days was 18 hours, I had a lot of time to think about it. And I worked out that these six young guys from Newcastle, just six guys who tap dance quite well, not great, but tap dance quite well, had put together a show. They found a platform. They were being paid for doing it. They created an international or an intellectual property. And now they were traveling the world. And I said to myself, Loring, you can do that. And I got off the plane. I went to my offices in Midrand or Halfway House, it was then called. And there's a big uh, mound of sand outside the office. And I called my associate out. And she said, what are you doing here? I thought, she said, I thought you've only just got back from America. Why aren't you in bed? Why aren't you resting? No, no, I want to show you something. And I took off my shoe and my sock and I put my foot in the sand. I said, Debbie, that's our next show. She said, what do you mean that's your next show? I said, she said, what, a footprint? I said, no. But I said, let me think about it. And within 24 hours, I said, no, it's going to be an African footprint. And the reason I did that was because I felt I'd been so blessed with the work I'd been given, the life that I'd had, the success that I'd had, the health that I'd had, that I had to give something back. And I thought, 
have, have you got enough money to satisfy everybody? No, you don't. Why don't you take your experience starting back in Guernsey as a choir boy, as a, a, a Carol Levis discovery, and all the shows you've done, take that experience and mentor people. And that was the start of African Footprint. And then I said, right, we need a title, African Footprint. We created the, the logo, which you've got, which is my brand. We created that brand. And I took the show on for uh, 16 months. I was given backing by a major, major company who pulled out. And all of a sudden, I was a million in debt. When the show opened, I was three million in debt because still no, I had nobody had backed me. But I had that belief in my mind that the show had got legs. And I was able to find uh, people like Don Matera, who at this moment in time, as I'm talking to you, I say a little prayer for him because actually he's in the hospital. He suffered a major heart attack. He's a great poet. Um, and we were doing a show for one of the big banking communities. I was doing a special event. And I used him as the master of ceremonies. And if you look back in history, I'll show you how long ago it was, because halfway through the event, he went out onto the floor and said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to our next Minister of Finance, Comrade Trevor Manuel, and looked at the audience and said, you see, when the first sun rose, it found us awake and waiting. Long before they came to this hill, our footsteps shaped the landscape, tamed the buffalo, we rode the wind, we silenced the hurricane. Look at us, we have been here before. There was absolute silence. And as I heard that silence, I thought, where did that come from? Because I needed something to drive my show along. Was it going to be a Sangoma? Was it going to be a storyteller? I thought, no. And I took his words. I asked him if I could use the word phrase from his poems, uh, which we did. It finishes with, uh, look at us, we are the future. Our feet are drums beating the heritage of our native land. Yes, look at us, we are the future. So I took all of his poetry, embellished that into the show, created 18 songs, which dealt with We Have Been Here Before, to Nelson Mandela on Robben Island, to the Children of Africa, to Kelly Abaka, spiritual songs. And then on the opening night on May the 11th, lo and behold, there's President Thabo Mbeki sitting in the theater for our opening of an African footprint, which nobody knew about, everybody had heard about, everybody was suspicious. They said, where is this going to come from? What is this going to be like? And 300 people or 500 people jumped to their feet. And 21 years later, I say, thank you. Well, Richard, please tell us about that magical night on the eve of the new millennium when you presented mm -hmm. African footprint before Nelson Mandela and numerous other world leaders and dignitaries I understand it was televised and seen by an audience of 1.5 billion people. Yes, you're absolutely correct. I mean, we've been asked to, I had been asked to put three numbers together. And at the same time that I was doing that, I was starting to run out of money, to be very honest with you. But I had an introduction to go down to see uh, the, the, the minister, uh, Minister Esop Pahad. We were invited to do five numbers on Robin Island on, on Millennium Night. So at 5 to 11, on Millennium Night, I'm standing in a prison cell next to President Tarbo and Becky. And there's absolute silence. And as we look up, the, all the Robin Island, the Ravonia trialist walk past me, led by Ahmed Cathadra and then Nelson Mandela. They all peel off into his cells and Mandela stands there alone at the top of the cell. And my eight African footprint dancers come out of the cells with sticks, beating on the floor, beating on the wall, beating on the cell bars. And he looks down and there's a candle and he lights the candle. And as he lights the candle, a thousand children outside with flaming torches in, in the shape of Africa, South Africa, start singing in Kozi Sikalele. And that goes out to a billion and a half people around the world. And that was the launch of African Footprint. I understand you're hoping to make African Footprint into a film? Yes, I've been working on the, the, the script for some time. We, um, our last show was because of the lockdown, regrettably, but we had a wonderful success. We were invited to go to United Arab Emirates and we played at the Global Village. We were a little bit 
No, we weren't skeptical. We were very sure that we would win the audience over. However, the management knew that we were a brand and they wanted us there. But they said to me, Richard, don't be too alarmed because it was a massive, massive play. Don't be alarmed if the people kind of walk past licking ice creams and stand there for one minute and then carry on with their ice cream and disappear into to the Chinese pavilion or the Russian pavilion or something else. Anyway, I have to tell you, we went there from when those African drums started beating. Those people appeared, <laughs> I don't know where they came from, but night after night we did, we cut the show down to, uh, the show represents South, I wanted it to represent South Africa's past, present and future. And so we were able, thank goodness, in those 35 minute shows to represent that through the songs. And we did three shows a night where we played to three, 4,000 people a show and on New Year's Eve, 120,000 people watched African Footprint. We had a 50 meter digital screen and we showed the dunes, we showed the mining dumps, we showed uh, Sapphire Town, and we were able to talk about the history. And what we found fascinating were the people who came along and we night after night, we'd start seeing the same people with the same families. And I just thought that wonderful, thing that song and dance that what i call that cross culture which i experienced when i was 19 years of age um, i studied leader and so as a young leader a tenor i appeared in Hang Gothlin at the international i steadford as this young guy blonde hair blue eyes and a piece of corn behind my ear because where had i been i, I was naive and i arrived in this Hang Gothlin, and there were all these countries from all around the world all competing against each other all in different costumes not being able to communicate sometimes in speaking, but what we were able to communicate with was with our voice, with our song, with our poetry, with our dance. And so in a way, that is where that journey took me from then of 19 to eventually 1998, creating African Footprint and taking it around the world where an audience of 5,000 people at the Russian theater in, in China um, and all of these countries around the world where they don't speak the language, but understood the dance and the energy and the passion of what Africa is about. Richard, I must mention that I had the pleasure of meeting you through our mutual dear friend, Lynn Santer. Yes, what was, a wonderful uh, woman. <laughs> she was recently on our show to discuss her monumentally important film, Land of the Free in the Shadows. I know you're a strong supporter of the fight to ban trophy hunting of endangered Very species. Very much so. Very much so. Very much so. I just think that when you see these beautiful animals, and, and obviously I understand uh, the reference to culling, I understand that. Uh, but then I think if that's the case, then they must take the animals who were already sick and perhaps very aged. You don't go out as a trophy hunter and arrive from a country with a lot of money in your bag and pay to pick up a big shotgun and go out into the bush and somebody points to an elephant who is perhaps two or three years old or four years old or whatever, a tiger, a lion, a zebra, wh whatever it's going to be, and just say, I'm going to shoot it, cut off the head and put it on the wall of my study. All I hope is that that is going to fall down on them in their study and do to them what they did to the animal. That's what they deserve. I hope all of our viewers will support this award-winning movie by going to the link that you see on your screen now and watching the film. This is a special viewing event for our viewers available only until December 22nd. Also, if you purchase the 2022 Australian Firefighters calendar from this link, a portion of the proceeds will go to support the fight against trophy hunting. Please visit www.landofthefreemovie.com for more information. Together, we can win the fight to ban trophy hunting once and for all. Now, Richard, I want to mention as well that you've been repeatedly recognized for your illustrious contributions to South Africa. In my introduction, I mentioned the two Lifetime Achievement Awards you've received. You also organized the first multiracial fundraiser with your showbiz celebrity soccer team in Soweto. You served two terms as president of Rotary International and you received the Paul Harris Award for Community Service, and you're involved with the Duke of Edinburgh World Trust Foundation and the Theatre Benevolent Fund for the past 35 years. You truly believe in giving back to the community, don't you? Absolutely, absolutely. and it's not that I want somebody to pat me on the back for it, because that's the last thing. I just think that, as I mentioned to you, I come from a 
a, a very humble background with, with the most wonderful parents. And if you said to me, if you had one wish today, I would say to you, Harvey, I wish I could sit with my mum and dad and just say, thank you. And so in a way, by, given, by being, being given what I call a God-given talent, because it is a God-given talent, I believe that when you get a voice and you use it in the right way and it, it does feel what it's done for me, I, I could not have wished for anything more. Money, money could not buy that. And so that shilling a week for my singing lessons that's taken me around the world, it's to say thank you. And so in a way, when I decided to do African Footprint, and when I see members of our profession who have fallen I call on hard times and the spotlight has moved away from them because in life we have our moments of success and then it goes past us, but we are still there. And so we have maybe hundreds of thousands, millions of people, especially during this time that we've had COVID-19 and the new variants that have scared people, people have lost their lives. People are sitting in homes. They can't pay the rent. They can't put food in the table. And so all those years ago, I said, what can I do to help either doing shows, or just be supportive to people who are my people. That they, This is where I come from. How can I help? Is it enough? Possibly not. But even that little knock on the door saying, here's a Christmas gift that we'll be doing this year to our beneficiaries. When you see the tears in their eyes, and you, they know they're never going to work again, the spotlight is never going to come onto them. And anything that, that kind of tells them that they're still special, then I, I would just say to people out there who sometimes question actors and, and, and performers and think, well, they earn all of this money, they're all successful. Sometimes people get it wrong. They, they define success as money, money, money. It's not that because success has two heads. It brings success and it brings a lot of anxiety and a lot of sometimes you, you can't ha keep up with success because you don't have the fame anymore. So if there are people out there who get asked to support people in the industry who are battling at the moment, I would say, please, they need your help. Amen to that. Now, you've mentioned that you're writing a memoir. Can you tell us when you think it might be published? Yes, I, I think that this time next year, before next year, probably um, August, September, uh, I'm filling in all the gaps because I go to bed at night and I wake up in the middle of the night. Oh, you'd forgotten that story. You'd forgotten about what happened there and what happened there. What happened with Cameron? What happened with Barry? And what happened when you were, were in so-and-so? So, you know, the, the important thing is it's very difficult because even with an interview, uh, let's be honest, we have to have a little bit of an ego, otherwise we would never be in show business in the first place. However, sometimes I think to myself, hell, Loring, you really must stop talking about yourself and what you're doing. And, I, and I'm just hoping that with the stories that I've got and where I've come from, I'm just hoping to that the story, which will be embellished in many, many ways with the good, the bad and the ugly, all those things, that somebody will read it and say, wow, this has really given me an inspiration to follow my dream. And I, I, and I think, Harvey, at this moment in time, with what's been going on and all the lives that have been lost and this, this, this great anxiety that we have to, are we going to be around tomorrow? Is our friend going to be around? Is our partner, is my wife and my family okay? All those kind of things. I think more than ever, we have to, we have to come together. We have to give back. And, and I think if through the book, people can see that. And, and like my daughters, they said, do you mind what we do, Dad? I said, no, I've given you an education. Go out. But like my father said to me, do what you want to do. Be happy because you get one shot. As Eddie Calvert said to me down in Port Elizabeth all those years ago with a bottle of champagne, he said, Richard, you've got to grab the moment. Well, so I'm going to grab the moment right now and ask you when the book comes out, will you come back on our show and promote it? It would be my privilege. It would be my honor. I would be. Yeah. Thank you. I would love that. Well, Richard, the last time we were together on Zoom, you enchanted everyone with your beautiful rendition of Edelweiss. Do you think I could persuade you to mm -hmm. sing one verse for us? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Let me just think about it. Um, let me, let me just tell, have we got time to, for me to tell the story just before I tell that of Maria von Trapp? Sure. 
Okay. We're, we're closing down because the show is, the film is going to open um, at the Dominion Theatre. And we're, we're getting into our last few weeks. And it's a Monday night and the curtain drops and we go to walk off. And all of a sudden we see this elderly lady making her way through us and going to the front of the stage. And we think, oh, wow, what is that? And the audience are absolutely stunned. They sit down because the show is over. They sit down and said, ladies and gentlemen, you don't know who I am. But tonight you've heard the story about the beautiful Maria von Trapp and the very handsome Baron von Trapp, the captain. And you've heard about their romance through the, through the von Trapp family. She said, I am Maria von Trapp. The audience gasped aloud. And she said, a lot of people have asked me from the book, The Von Trapp Family, how we managed to take this and turn it into a movie. And she said, a lot of people approached us with songs, but she said, it's only when Rodgers and Hammerstein came along and they produced a song, which was not in the, in the show, but in the film. And she said, it goes like this. And I want you to listen to it because it's who I am as who the family were. A bell is no bell to ring it. A song is no song till you sing it. And love in your heart isn't put there to stay. Love isn't love till you give it away. And she walked off. Thank you. A good night. And she walked off the stage to almost silence and then the most thunderous applause. Now, the fact that I can tell that story all these years later show you how, how important it was. And all I remember when I was in the show, Roger Dan, as the Nazis were getting ready to invade Austria, and they did their last performance. And when he picked up his guitar, and he very gently said, Edelweiss, Edelweiss, every morning you greet me, small and white, clean and bright you look happy to greet me blossom of snow may you bloom and grow bloom and grow forever hey Edelweiss, bless my homeland forever. Ooh. Wow, you got me. You always do. Richard, it's been <laughs> such a pleasure having you on our show to celebrate your renowned career. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me and my viewers. Thank you. Our guest has been the legendary internationally acclaimed performer and producer, Richard Loring. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.